Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. And for those of you that are able, we invite that you would stand with us. Ephesians 6. And I'll start reading at verse 10. And it reads, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I'll repeat one part that I really want to focus on. Verse 14, it says, stand your guard putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. You all may take your seats. And as you're doing so, I would like to title today's message, Is There Truth? Is There Truth? Many of you have been along, walk, walking along with us as we started this series entitled Pastoral Letters. And similar to the epistles of the Bible, these letters that were written to churches in antiquity, I have picked up this mantle, this idea of dealing with some of the issues that we have that are in front of us today in ways that I believe God might be inspiring us right now. In fact, if I could, I would use my, 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 my spiritual imagination and I would wonder if the Bible was being penned right now, if we as a church were located in this era, in this region, what might God or what might God's uh, apostles be writing to us to give us the ability to stand firm, to encourage and to continue to move in the faith? What might be some of the encouragements? What might be some of the issues that we would have to confront? What are the things that I truly believe that God cares about? Because sometimes if we could just be honest, we care about stuff that God probably don't care about. And God cares about stuff that we probably don't think about as much as we should, right? So what are some of these things that are paramount, that are important, that may have the ability to build one's faith, build one's life in Christ, and what are some of these things that we may need to leave aside? And herein I come to the idea of is there truth. Now, some of you know very well, I love movies. I enjoy the ability to see not just what is there to entertain me, but oftentimes lift up new principles, new ideas, new things that people show. In fact, oftentimes this is what entertainment is for. It is meant to communicate a message. Sometimes we grab easily and sometimes that is not so easy. But one of my favorite movies, probably in my top 10 all-time favorite movies, is a movie by the name Vantage Point. Point. Vantage Point came out in 2008 and it had starring Dennis Quaid and Forrest Whitaker. This movie was about the assassination or at least the assassination attempt of an American president. And what I thought was amazingly novel about this movie is that every time you went through a set of events, the movie would rewind. 
start back at the beginning point and show you a different perspective of the same set of facts, of the same occurrence. And if you were watching maybe the initial viewpoint, you may have believed one thing. But seeing a different perspective, it now made you question if you knew what you thought you knew. As you would watch, you would see, and surely as this shot rang out, you would see an individual running, and immediately you would say, that's the gunman. The next time you will watch through, you would see the same thing, but from a different vantage point, and you would figure out that's not the gunman, but that was somebody potentially chasing the gunman. Then you will see a whole different perspective and come to find out the American president wasn't even there in the first place. Then you will find out over and over until finally you recognize that even though I thought I saw something, I still didn't have the truth. Now, some of you know exactly where we are in our world right now as we are struggling with notions and concepts of the truth. In fact, I've been gifted to be able to be in classroom settings uh, with uh, young students. And one of the things I would always hear, especially as I was teaching ethics, is how people would come in and they would say statements such as, my truth and your truth. In fact, we lift it up. There's a, a great article in The Atlantic about o Oprah Winfrey as she was writing and, and, and closing down her show in 2011. They, they lift this up about how Oprah lifted up this amazing speech about my truth. And oftentimes this notion of my truth meant to bring voices that had not been at the table to the forefront so that we can rightly see what is really happening. However, the way that she framed her speech kind of made it seem that there was no ultimate truth, that everything was subjective. And I would hear this over and over again from students that it was never really an objective truth. There really is no such thing as truth. It really only is our perspective, how you see, how you experience, what you perceive, then becomes true. And then in our world where we're dealing with a variety of different people, we have more different races, cultures, and everything all inhabiting one space, it is easier to navigate life that way. But oftentimes we also recognize that it is not completely adequate as then people lift up truths that then we have to say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't seem to be okay. I can't say my truth only exists here, and then if somebody has racist or sexist tendencies, to say that, well, is that really their truth? All of a sudden, what happens now when we have multiple perspectives of truth bump into one another, what becomes the answer? If there's no objective truth, then it does not matter. Something about that just doesn't seem right. And only does something about that not seem right as a faith practitioner and one that is led to lead a community, that's problematic because if there is no ultimate truth, there can be no God. And uh, as much as I would love from all my, my theological studies or all my ideas of philosophy, I can't ascend or descend to that theory. Amen. So is there truth? Is there truth in your life? And this is important. This is why philosophy in so many areas have often gone and tried to answer this question because predicated on the answer will determine how you live your life. Is there truth? Is it truth that you can ascertain? Can you ever grab it? Can you get it? Because without it, everything begins to fall apart. It reminds me of the, the Roots CD that came out February 1999, When Things Fall Apart, which is uh, based off of a novel about Nigeria. This whole idea of when we look at the world and there is no underlying holding point, things begin to fall apart. Yet we have this amazing scripture in the book of Ephesians or the letter of, to the Ephesians, if it's generally to the Ephesians, where we're writing to a group of people who are being forced to deal with the challenges of their day 
and to appropriate their faith in that moment. And the writer, this Pauline epistle, this belief that is Paul that is writing this, that the writer says, I don't want you to get confused. Your fight is not with the person sitting next to you. It is not housed in the human person, even as much as the enemy likes to use people. Our fight may not be with people, but people always are a part of the fight. Our fight may not be with people, but people always are a part of that fight. I'm just going to let that sit there. He says, your fight is not with flesh and blood. You're not really trying to go and apprehend or take down your brothers or your sisters or these other ones. But there is something far more menacing. There is something far more problematic, something far more powerful that is in the background. That there are powers that you don't see. Forces that are at work. Evil that is present. And your way to get beyond it is not by trying to take down the people. In fact, your only way to deal with it is by utilizing armor. And this armor is different. It's not your normal armor, but to make it make sense, he used the armor of the day. He kind of went through this, this category of what they would normally wear. You would see the Roman guard walking. This will help you be able to grasp what you're trying to do. And he says, as I open this, before I get to everything else, the first thing you need to put on, first thing that I want to lift up, the article of clothing that actually holds all of the rest of it together is the belt of truth that around the loins that would hold the breastplate and your sword and protection locks in place with the belt and that this belt is truth in the Greek aletheia this notion of what God gives for our understanding. What God is, is there, that there is truth. And it is up to us to get to it. And not just get to it often for us to allow it to get to us. That God has a way of communicating to us. And he wants us to have this. He says, I need you to have truth. I don't want you going through the world being deceived. I don't want you going through the world without proper information or without proper knowledge. I don't want you to start off this way because this could change the way that you deal and interact in life. So again, I ask, is there truth? I say this because there are so many things, so many op options, so many concerns, so many places of confusion that inhabit our world right now. And, and I've always desired to be part of a faith community that could be honest and not overly spiritual or religious so that we miss the truth about the things that we're dealing with. Some of you have heard the controversy around CRT. And it's, it's oftentimes, this is going to sound terrible, but I know no nicer way to say it. So I'm asking for forgiveness ahead of time for how bad this is going to sound. And know that I really do mean I have good intentions. I really do, but I cannot figure out a better way to say this. That ain't been a problem in the black church. Like, I mean, let's, let's just be honest. It is not a black church issue. Nobody in the black church is like, wait a minute, critical race theory, this is problematic. In fact, if you've been to the black church at any point in your life, some part of critical race theory has probably been preached as gospel. It was so akin to gospel, you couldn't tell the difference between one or the other. And some of us, 
Even now, if we're asked to think about what it is, we would think, oh, it's just the teaching of race. That's, that's actually not what it is. It's this kind of legal endeavor where it talks about the ways in which race has affected laws and institutions. And, and just as soon as I said that, all, all, all of, yeah, well, I can understand that. Dude. I can see that, right? It's not, it's not a problem. And let me say this, it's a theory. Like everything else, when we know that we don't know its fullness, we give an approximation of how to deal with it to help us get understanding. It acknowledges by the word theory that we know that it might be disproven at some point, but there's something to it that we cannot completely overlook. Right? We, we know of the Pythagorean theorem. It's the same thing. There's a best way to approximate this. It works in a lot of different facets, but you may get to a space where it doesn't. The theory of relativity, which probably doesn't touch most of our lives, but the idea is that there's a way that things function at this very high level, and most of us will never have to deal with it, and it is there until it is proven otherwise. Is there truth? Is there a problem about this? I'm often amazed at how the Christian community at large is motivated to be so vocal about stuff that is rarely connected to the things that you see Jesus vocal about. Rarely. And I want us to hear this because this is part of the truth. Part of the truth is that we as believers sometimes can be co-opted into fighting and being worried about certain things, not because they really matter to God, but because there's political benefit to move us one way or the other. Thus, we have been railroaded to believe that there's only one way to think about something and anything that is different or skewed from that way of thinking it's problematic. Wait a minute. Where's the truth? Where's the truth? How is that critical to your salvation? I guarantee when we stand before God, God is not going to take us down some amazing liturgy that deals with the nuances of critical race theory. Is there truth? How do we live in this life? And we talk about this all the time, right? Like, how do we live in this life with so many things for us to deal with? And, and you know, I'll, I'll throw out another one. COVID-19. Right? Like, what is this? And, 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 and I want to church this honest. I want to church this honest. Please, 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 please be honest with me. We all are concerned about that. And I'm looking around. I don't know of any medical professionals or chemists or biologists in the room that could say one way or the other if it's exactly true or not true, but we all know we've dealt with it. Over 700,000, and we can even point to individuals in our church who've died from it. I, I, I don't need to fight if there is COVID-19. Then we can even talk about the vaccine. And again, I am not an official. I'm not telling you what to do. But I do say, might there be something to where we get information? And on the other side, might it be something to folks who are concerned? See, that's, that's where the church needs to be. We need to be honest. Negative things have happened. For folks to have honest vaccine hesitancy, we can't act like that's not true or that that's not spiritual, because it is. We've seen things misused before. However, we also should do the homework. If your hesitancy is strictly from somebody you saw on YouTube, <laughs> that has zero degrees, and maybe one GED. I'm just saying, 
Is that the best place to grab your information? How do we discern truth? He says, this idea, this is what holds it all together, that you would be girded with truth. So if there is truth, how do we find it? How do we learn it? There's a professor of law out of London who goes through this. He's a law of finance, and he talks about the issues that we've come into in what they call the post-truth. What he says is really not post-truth. It's just post-data. He said what many of us do, and I know the church is, is part of this, and I am part of it is we have a great way of what we call confirmation bias. Everybody say confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. Meaning that if we already kind of believe stuff, we gravitate to the things that prove what we already believe. And those are the things that we hold to be the, the standards. They fill it in. They help us to affirm what we rightly believe. And we completely discount everything else. But well, there's a problem with that. Because that doesn't necessarily mean that just because somebody else said it, that it's true. That somebody else thinks the way that you think doesn't mean that that's the right way. How do we discern if it is right? And I know this is heavy because that also goes to how we get to faith. And most of my faith life, I was taught not to question the faith. I was taught not to learn about other faiths. I was taught these things with the belief that those other things would move me away. Until I go to seminary and I'm faced with this question. If God is truth, why am I scared to seek it. All right. That's a good question. Hear me. Hear me. If God tells us to gird ourselves with truth, if God is truth, we don't have to be scared about other information changing the truth. We don't have to worry about our children finding out information that might take them away from truth. Now, we need to make sure they get truth. Amen. Because other information absent of truth can lead to deception. But when truth is there, other information either has to bow down to it or it supports it. I don't have to worry about it. I want you to hear this, church. Our God is big enough. His truth is real enough. It is amazing enough that it can stand scrutiny. That God is not worried about somebody investigating his truth or well-being. God is not worried about somebody saying, is there or is there not? Our God is big enough. Because I guarantee there is no way that you can get back to where we are absent truth unless you choose not to believe. Because I've said it before, we all believe something. We all hold to something. Even the amazing scientists and those with these amazing minds that try to make it, make it seem as if belief and faith are minuscule or unintelligent, they believe something. We start with what used to be called the Big Bang, but we've progressed now. We call it uh, the particular event. Is a particularity happen. Do you know how much faith you got to put? <laughs> Do you know how much faith you got to have? to believe in something you can't fully articulate. The particularity says that infinite mass is in an infinitely small speck and for reasons unknown explodes to create all things that we now know for no other reason than that infinity and finitude merged together. <laughs> Listen to it. And these are scientists. These are folks with degrees. They believe something. Because our truth holds. But that doesn't scare me because 
Let's say that that as a theory is true. I always say, well, who made the Big Bang Bang? Where did the infinite mass come from? What caused all of these things to happen? And if you can, if you can even grab into your mind, what would allow all of that, this amazing mass, to turn into sentient life? Do you know the probability, the numbers that even allow for something like that to happen are so ridiculously small that it is literally almost perfectly fine to say it's impossible? Save. There is a truth out there. Save. There's a God out there. Save. There is one that is able to do that which completely confounds our minds. The truth is there truth. Let me tell you, yeah, it is. Yeah, there's truth. And this truth is true not just because we believe, but because even those that don't believe will have to run into it. I, I hear my, my, my Savior saying in John chapter 8 that the truth shall set you free. I, I hear him saying in that very same book, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That only those who go through me will be able to make it to the Father. I'm so glad that there is truth. That this truth is the very thing that saves my soul. That this truth is now in the person of Jesus Christ. Save none other, none other like he, because all things rest and reside in him. This is what the writer of Ephesians is talking about. And he says, the only way that you will make it through the difficulties the only way that you make it through the trials, the, the only way that your righteousness and your faith and the sword of the spirit are all working together is you got to hold to that truth. You got to let that truth buckle all around you. You got to let that truth be the thing that leads you. You got to let the very knowledge of God be the thing that holds you day in and day out. When you in the hospital and when you're out. When you got the job, when you don't got the job. No matter what where you that's the truth that we hold to there's truth in the gospel that the gospel is it and I'm so glad when I talk to people and get a chance to tell them about this thing that don't make sense I know it don't make sense it sounds crazy when we say it but I believe that that there is a God somewhere and that God loved us so much that he gave his son and, and that son decided to come down to life and, and in that life that son took on death and when he took on death it provided life for me and his blood dripped down a crossing tree and made sure I can live to eternity I got a God somewhere but I'm also reminded that that's not how the story ends. That in three short days, he rose again. I got a God somewhere. And I'll say this, I've never heard of another belief. I, I've never heard of another God. I've never heard of another entity that did what my God did for me. If you save me, I'll follow you. But if you can't save me, I can't follow you. Is there truth? Yeah, there's truth. Yes, there's truth. And this truth wraps around us. This truth leads us. This truth makes sure that all is well. Don't be deceived. Don't get overly worked up about things that don't ultimately matter. But there is a God. And that God sees you right where you are. Knows what you've been through and has chosen a life for you, has chosen you out of it all, that the Spirit of God might be able to call you to God's self. This is the truth. This is why we worship. This is why we come to church. This is why we read our Bibles. This is why we live lives the way that we do. It is not because we think we're holy or better than. It's because I found truth. And that truth has changed my life. 
And I can't act like it, it ain't been changed. I can't act like I've ever been the same. It has never been anything like this before. And it still has power today. Is there truth? Oh, yes, it is. And I pray that you will accept that truth today. Pray with me.